Good morning and welcome to Legal Tech Live. This show is taking place on March 11th, 9.15 a.m. I'm Nick Rishwain, your host here with my co-host. Ivan Raikland. It's actually 11.15 where I am. So Pacific Standard Time for 9.15. My name is Ivan Raikland and I'm also co-host of the Legal Tech Live show. A little bit about myself for those of you that don't know. It's uh, I'm a recovering lawyer, diplomat, Green Beret. Today I'm sporting my Green Beret Foundation shirt, who I actually uh, was able to tour down in uh, San Antonio yesterday in Texas. But now I'm sitting here at uh, in Austin, Texas, doing the interview amidst the largest conference on tech and interactive and whatnot at uh, South by Southwest. So it's good to be here with you guys. Excellent. Welcome aboard, hum human, uh, and uh, Peter. Yeah, so, and we're here today with uh, Peter Hun and Human Shadab from Claws. This is the world's first. They've created what Claws, and you can find them online at Claws.io or on Twitter at ClawsHQ. And what Claws is, is the world's first data driven IoT enabled legal contracts. And we're going to get into a little bit about what that means shortly. Uh, they have, uh, they are proudly at Seed Camp and at Next Law Labs. Uh, it, those have been supporting uh, financiers, it seems like, uh, from, uh, from what we see on your bios. But Peter and Human, please, let's go. We're going to go from Peter, then we'll go to Human. Uh, and if you guys will just please tell us a little bit about yourselves and then we'll walk into a little bit more about Claws. So Peter, please tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got into legal tech. Sure. So, um, yeah, I read law, um, as you can probably tell by the, the accent in, in the UK and in the US. Uh, moved to the US uh, about two years ago um, and really got involved in, in legal tech through um, working in private equity in, in London. I got exposed to a lot of startups there um, and sought ways really to use my kind of legal background in startups. Um, work, worked in a couple on, on, on the legal side and um, Human and I met through, uh, through that and uh, we're knocking around ideas as to what the future of law was going to look like and, and lawyering and um, really kind of settled upon uh, this sort of concept that we're working on now and we'll obviously go into a bit more detail later. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for that. And Human, please tell me about yourself. I understand there's a little uh, professorial uh, activity uh, that you're taking place in or have take, that you have done uh, in, the, in the recent past. Tell us about yourself. Yeah, sure. For, for the last, I think, eight years or so, I've been a professor at New York Law School where I sort of specialize in, in teaching, researching, writing, and editing um, research about um, uh, all uh, various aspects of uh, business and financial law, and, and certainly in the, in the recent years, um, the intersection of sort of law, business, finance, and technology, like Bitcoin, blockchains, and certainly now legal tech. And prior to that, I was uh, an attorney at a couple of big law firms, and, and certainly um, throughout my life, I've had an interest in technology. Um, and so it was really fortuitous to sort of meet Peter uh, a couple of years ago now, almost, and just sort of get involved with this uh, company and project. Um, I've been sort of leading up into this space or sort of been uh, more on the governmental side of thing or public, more of the policy oriented and regulatory aspects of, let's say, um, blockchain or financial regulation generally. But, I, but increasingly, I was sort of advising uh, companies in this space um, like Augur and so forth. And so, you know, having that, get, get, seeing what startups are doing, how exciting things are, how, how fast things are changing, sort of just writing and teaching about it isn't really, I think, enough, at least for me. So just having the opportunity to get involved directly, make change happen instead of sort of watching it from the sidelines, which also is very important, um, is, is really exciting to, to, to be a really part of. Excellent. And can you, can you guys tell us where did you meet? And because uh, Peter was from the UK, he's been here for a couple of years now, he mentioned. How did you guys meet and how did you decide, hey, we should do this? Right. So we met on a... In the beginning. Give it, take us <laughs> through the genesis of the Right. Sure. Um, so yeah, we, we met uh, we met a, a couple of years ago now, as, as Hima mentioned. Um, he was actually an advisor to another startup that I was working on. 
uh, which is in the kind of uh, financial technology space. Um, and uh, obviously with a, with a mutual interest and, and a background in, in legal, um, we were knocking around some ideas um, when we were kind of really looking at the way that the um, smart contracts and the blockchain was gonna go. And um, we, we saw a lot of opportunity in, in kind of reinventing or kind of reestablishing what, what a contract actually is. Because there, there seemed to be this kind of perfect storm almost of, of kind of IoT being able to track the physical world, open APIs that could provide data um, into contracts. And um, that, that was really the, the kind of mutual interest that we had in how we can make kind of contracting and, and contracts better. Um, so I'd say that that was really the, the genesis of, uh, of the idea actually as, a, as another startup. Excellent. Excellent. And when did you guys, uh, it was it, did you move here, Peter for, to work on clause? Was that the, no, I previously moved here. Okay. You had previously moved here. Okay. Excellent. So what I think our listeners and probably even Ivan and I want to know is about what do you mean? by an IoT enabled contract. What what does that mean? Because that sounds really complicated. And for those uh, listeners who remember contract law, probably one of the harder uh, first year law, law school classes. And this sounds like you guys are talking about something out of sci-fi for first year law students. Right. If you don't mind, break it down as I say, Barney style. <laughs> and then we'll build it from there. Yeah. And, and either of you, whoever whoever feels most comfortable describing this, or or both of you probably want to contribute on it, but please, I'm happy. Who meant you want to? Oh, sure, yeah. And so you know, um, as we sort of talked about, as we came, um, sort of Peter came to me at the company, and we talked about the idea. We just saw a gap between the the static paper traditional world of contracts, which is in principle not too different from the tablets of a. Uh, a millennia ago and just the the data-driven world of enterprise and iot and analytics and so forth and bridging that gap we want to say well how, how can contracts sort of be a part of this broader uh, business ecosystem that itself is just evolving and dynamic and the idea between an iot enabled contract is for our contracts uh for the sort of the the embedded or latent implicit data mm -hmm. that is embedded in a contract to just be connected uh uh, electronically to the, the physical world. So when um, various terms and conditions and performance obligations of contracts are uh, actually referring to the real world, uh, we want that to happen basically in real time. So you know the status of your counterparty's performance. So you know the status wow. of perhaps a payment and therefore the contract, an IoT enabled contract is simply a contract that adjusts and responds to the physical world as relevant to obviously the terms and conditions. This is fascinating. This awesome. is fascinating. <laughs> I mean, it really is. Uh, you know, right, for, for some legal tech geeks, it's, it's pretty <laughs> It exactly. may not be fascinating to all of us, uh, everybody out there, every listener, but for, for me, I think it's amazing. So you're talking about, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember the terminology of, of changed circumstances in, in law school and mm -hmm. in one L in contracts. It, so those changing circumstances means the contract actually change with that, changes with that. So if the price of the good mm -hmm. is changing during the performance, the contract is actually changing with that price. Is that, is that a way to kind of explain mm -hmm. it to a layperson or, or Absolutely. Just... Yeah. So that was actually the, uh, the kind of the first contract that we produced that used data and was, a, as you say, an IoT enabled legal contract. And what that did was essentially um, it's kind of become kind of the archetypal use case for, um, for IoT now. But um, we, we really had a, a contract that um, tracked the shipment of a good from one party to another party. And um, the conditions in the shipping container, so temperature and humidity, vibration, for example, were monitored by, by sensors. And if they kind of that temperature and humidity fell outside of the stipulated ranges in the contract, then you could have various kind of repercussions from that. So you could have a price decrease in real time because it didn't ship in, in accordance with the conditions in the contract. Or you could have a warranty extend because it was exposed to excessive temperatures for a certain period of time. Um, so, yeah, 
Exactly. Right, that's phenomenal. So yeah, I'm also <laughs> interested in how this is going to play out too. So in terms of your data points, how are you tracking all of this? And then also if you can explain, I know there's probably some intellectual property involved with it, but at the top layer, can you explain how the data is obtained and then fed into the contract to be able to monitor and make those adjustments, whether it be in price or Sure. So um, we there's kind of two two layers to this. So um, kind of the data sources are is all kind of brought in through API. So um, whether in in the case of IoT, it was typically through an IoT platform that has um, sensors connected to it, uh, and then you can aggregate the data and then pull it into the contract. So that's really for for the IoT based use cases. That's really our point of drawing data in, um, and how we actually use that data. We have a concept called the smart clause. So um, what we mean by smart clause are modular clauses that you can put into existing legal contracts that evaluate the data that's being drawn in um, based on various variables that you set. So it could be if the temperature is above a certain range, so it's you know, 70 Fahrenheit for 10 minutes, then the price could be decreased by 10%, for example, and that could be straight line or compounded or however you wish to set it. So you're constantly evaluating data that's being exposed to the contract, essentially in real time. Now, so are you taking some of the concepts of if this, then that, and Zapier to apply to the legal, I guess, to your clause concept? It's very close, yeah. So it's, it's a very close analogy. Um, it's not quite there, but I mean, I, I guess it's the closest non-legal analogy that we could, uh, we could work off of. Yeah, so certainly the rise of uh, the API economy or the API ecosystem and web services more generally has really enabled this, our, our innovation really to, to um, happen. You know, I don't think 10, 15 years ago really would have been possible, but now that there's all this data and out there and available, um, we can now, legal can really just plug right into it. That's fascinating. It, it, it seems to me that uh, I'm thinking of that that theory of uh, or the doctrine of substantial performance, mm -hmm. but you can almost now get just exact on mm -hmm. how how much of that performance was completed uh, based on you, based on the data that's available. Is that would that seem to be accurate? Yeah. So substantial performance being the doctrine that the default doctrine for uh, performance of contracts that triggers the counterparty's obligation. Right. But yeah, we can bring real visibility to see exactly how substantial that performance was. Right. And of course, the parties can contract a real granular, highly customized basis on what triggers what and um, what the consequences of not the having the um, actual performance being performed. So. Uh, yeah, parties can sort of really move beyond that type of uh, very generalized right. of good enough to something much more customized. Now, let's get into a little bit about the, uh, I, I, I understand the, in general terms, the technology about it at this point. But in terms of what are your clients, are they, do they range from large organizations primarily because that data set is there for them? Or do you also work with some smaller organizations? <laughs> Yeah, so we really see the kind of the customer stack, if you will, going from SMEs to large corporates. So um, obviously SMEs aren't going to have, at least today, the, uh, the IoT networks that large corporates are putting in place uh, right. currently. But that doesn't mean that, that you know, we're just an IoT-only company. Um, so we enable you to use any data source into contracts. So that may be something as simple as tracking a shipment through FedEx or through kind of ground transportation and um, across obviously tons of contracts that you're running uh, and then automate payment uh, notification of kind of delayed deliveries and price changes as a result of delayed deliveries for example and that's now, are you linking in directly to a FedEx or a UPS for the shipping piece or some of these other IOT uh, yes yes so we can essentially any any kind of open API is is kind of available to us um, and then there's obviously some private agreements that we can have with those that don't expose public APIs. Wow. Is anybody else doing this or are you guys the only ones? Yeah. So I think we're kind of, uh, kind of flag bearers for IoT and data driven contracts in a way. Um, so n nobody else that we're aware of. Yeah. Uh, I'm that, blown away. This is it, great. I know. <laughs> it really is cool. I'm, I'm, I love it because we've talked to probably 30 different startups and we've talked to some smart legal contract startups uh, oh. that we've interviewed. And, and this seems to be, 
this seems to be the first that I've heard of this type of a smart contract. Those are more for contract creation and so forth and, and contract um, uh, reviewing the terms and conditions and things mm -hmm. like that. So this is different uh, than anything I have I have seen before. Right, I would have never thought to crowd. Essentially, you're crowdsourcing the information in a contract. Most people, can, you know, think of a contract. It's a fixed, uh, I guess, document, mm -hmm. and then it's only afterwards you litigate the the, the terms inside of it. Yeah. Whereas now, it's essentially a real time uh, litigation, if you will, of yeah. what the document means. Right. But so I'll, yeah, that, that was the problem that we were speaking yeah. about um, at, the, at the outset was the contracts are these static natural language documents and you don't have real-time visibility into their state which is the cause of pretty much any contractual issue that you have is because you cannot see the real-time state it brings so, living breathing document to a whole nother level only level yeah. an actual <laughs> living breathing level yep right. yeah which exactly. is which when i was reading about you guys uh reading about clause not not about you two in particular i was like what do they mean by that right i had to go to a couple of your different blog posts well, what would a living breathing contract be i don't get that so i had to read a couple of blog posts to get this understanding so it, i mean it's it's really sort of a, a transcendent thought of a contract being uh, living and breathing who it can one or the other of you take credit for that idea uh, or was it a combination it, yeah, it's a combination was it yeah. so it's it, it's a a product really of us iterating on various um various ideas over a period of time and then settling on this as being really what we saw as the future of contracting so yeah. i think um, i think peter can definitely take credit though for sort of starting this this company thinking about um thinking about clauses and in like smart clauses in a way that's, that's sort of modular. I, I remember him coming to me with that idea, which was sort of new to me, but it, it just it struck me as really um, true. And it really, really struck, a, struck a chord with me like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to think of clauses that way. And then sort of, and the, I guess it was more of a maybe organic evolution to get into IoT specifically. Yeah, fascinating. This is great stuff. So, so tell us what you can here. Um, as far as uh, adoption, who who is the person or or group that would be using Clause? Uh, who is going to be your customer? Is it going to be a business? It's certainly not the law firm, so I'm guessing it's going to be the business, or maybe a law firm could use it as well. Who is who is the target customer in this situation? So it really depends upon the vertical that you're that we're targeting. So we're, we're focused on rollout of, of really two areas at the moment, um, which are kind of service level agreements and supply agreements. Um, and obviously, the, I mean, in, in service level, it's more kind of the IT team within an organization and with supply, there may be a specific supply and change department or contract managers that, um, that are really the buyers of the product in that instance. Um, but apart from the kind of corporate level, we also see um, application and kind of purchases being made by law firms. So uh, we're working with Dentons, the world's largest law firm uh, at the moment uh, to, to really develop the product for, for their lawyers to use you know, internally. And then we're also launching, as I, as I said before, the kind of link through, through Clio um, next week at the, the ABA Tech Show. So um, we see application for both, both lawyers to use it and draft these kind of smart, even though we... I don't really like the term um, data driven or intelligent contracts um, for their clients to add value. So um, there's a, we can get into that. There's a whole bunch of benefits for lawyers specifically, but um, we're focused mainly on kind of corporates, I guess. Okay. Yeah. And it's certainly as, as, but as, as a legal services industry also is evolving, I think we are meeting the needs for lawyers to provide a more holistic and integrated services for their clients, including sort of business and financial and operational certainly as well. And so certainly lawyers, I think we, we, would, we would really empower them to provide a different level of transactional or maybe more broadly operational service, both with in-house inside counsel and outside as well. And especially as perhaps the legal services delivery is going more towards a fixed uh, fixed pricing as opposed to hourly billing model. Then it says, okay, for a given price, 
which lawyer can provide me with the best services for outside law firms. And this would, using this technology or, or whatever enabling technology, that is gonna be the type of, I think, uh, tool that lawyers increasingly will be looking at to, to provide an edge for their, um, for their clients and, and for their services. Excellent. This All right, is, I, have a, I have a question. Yeah, here. go for it. So I'm looking at your uh, angel list page here. Uh, there's a couple of you there. I mean, both of you are here. How big is the team? Uh, looks like you have a few folks that are employees as well. And essentially, if you can kind of explain, yeah, uh, essentially the two of you that started, and then how did it build out over the course of the last uh, essentially two years to get where you where we are today, in terms of from a startup business standpoint. Sure. Um, so we, we started, as you say, with the, the two of us with the genesis of the idea. And then we uh, kind of iterated uh, on that idea, um, hacked together a few kind of, uh, um, I guess, demos, um, presented that to Seedcamp and Nextfall Labs, who then invested pre seed funding in us. And we then were then able to. And that was just on, at the idea phase of it, right? You had the idea, you pitched it, and then you were able to raise the. Looks yeah, like the so that, that was a very small pre seed round. Uh, and then we build up the team from there. So um, we've now got kind of four four guys that are all technical in nature. And then there's the, the two lawyers. And we, we kind of like that ratio of uh, more technical. <laughs> it, and the, the phase that you're at now, uh, for uh, let, let's say, let's go with Human. Uh, human uh, excuse me on the pronunciation. I'm not in place today. Uh, <laughs> it's... Uh, are you guys still at a startup or a startup phase where you're in development or I guess that's the, are you in the development phase or are you aiming for customers at this point? Are you, are you selling the product at this point? Yeah, I mean, it's really aiming for customers. We're doing our first uh, real launch um, next week, actually ABA legal tech show. Okay. And yeah, so we are, you know, focusing our, on our initial use cases and initial products and sort of just building out from there. So, you know, I guess we're always developing, certainly, right. uh, but we are, we are beyond the mere ideation stage. We are beyond the uh, just, just development. But you're pre-revenue still at this point, correct? That's correct, yeah. Okay. And then hopefully next week at the ABA Tech Conference, where is that? Is that going to be in? Chicago. 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 And then after that, essentially, you're going to try to start doing your signups, right? That's correct. Perfect. Since we're on that topic, uh, what's going to be the pricing plan for the services that you provide? Right. So we're, we're focusing on a kind of tiered SaaS level at, at the moment. So in terms of the product rollout, we're, ha we're kind, of, kind of producing these smart, clause, smart clauses for integration into, um, into existing legal contracts. So that's the first product. Um, and then we're going to kind of turn that into like a full platform rollout with analytics and everything on top. Um, so the pricing point at, at the moment is, is kind of undefined for the smart clauses because we're working on kind of individual contracts uh, with, with, with customers. Um, and then once we kind of fill that out, then there'll be a um, kind of a definite um, pricing structure in place. Now you have some empirical data because you're doing probably some beta testing with some companies in order to figure out what model to use in terms of pricing. Uh, yes, yes, we're, okay. yeah, so we're, Denton's are our big kind of partner on yeah. that. And is Denton's your partner through their Next Law Labs arm, is that, yeah? Correct, yeah, so that, that um, so we're working with Denton's, but then, yeah, Next Law Labs, their kind of venture arm is also an investor in us. Okay, all right. Yeah, Denton's is really committed to innovation, and we have good relationships with them, their uh, key uh, innovation sort of leaders at the law firm itself. Yeah, they have been uh, been following what they've been up to for a while now, and and as far as law firms go, I really have to hand it to them for the innovation. That uh, in fact, Ivan, we should probably try and get somebody on from Next Law Labs or or from Denton's because, you know, what what you see in big law it, it generally doesn't seem to be a lot of innovation uh, and, and they are really stagnation seeing, comes to mind. Yeah, yeah. Stagnation comes to mind, but they seem to be leading the way uh, as far as innovation and legal technology is concerned. I want to uh, just alter the, the discussion for a second. And I'm wondering, uh, and this would be from Human's uh, point of view, mm -hmm. What are you seeing at, at the law or at the law school level? Are law schools really 
working to make the the students uh, because it was it was not a concern at all when I was in law school probably yeah. not a concern for any of you in law school are it, but now we have 26 states uh, who are requiring technical competency for attorneys are it in the education field is it changing are they making are there classes on legal technology or mm -hmm. technology competence or anything like that do you see it uh, do you see that changing at all advancing at all yeah absolutely um, it maybe uh, it, it definitely diff uh, varies from school to school but uh, there's there's a lot of legal technology education that's going on in in it, whether it's just pure legal technology and maybe uh, legal informatics type like a seminar or something or um, like I try to do sometimes I was doing like bring uh, technology issues into the classroom so teaching a class on contract management or looking at um, various types of uh, blockchain blockchain technology in the classroom I, I also teach a class of startups of venture capital which in part also got me to this to this phase because we are obviously part of the broader venture and startup community you know, as, as a legal tech um, startup mm -hmm. and um, I think that there's just this seismic shift in our economy where we've commoditized the ability to take an idea get funding start a company and ship products relatively soon and that's something that lawyers need to be a part of so I'm basically um, throwing a hackathon in my class and letting my students make projects and so I don't have to read their papers, <laughs> quite frankly, on some <laughs> level. But no, it's, it's, it's a good thing. So, um, and there's lots of tools to do that as well. And um, so I think that, you know, it's, it's definitely technology is coming into the classroom and schools. Different schools have more or less, I think, emphasis on it, but it really is sort of the future. And I think in some respects makes going to law school, being a lawyer, uh, more exciting now than it was in the past. Yeah, that's good. It's it's good to hear because it's a it is a prof, it's a profession that desperately needs to to learn and adopt these new technologies. So I'm glad to I'm glad that somebody who is also in the startup world is also in the classroom and and making those things. Uh, yeah, I'm certainly not the only one. As you know, I'm sure the usual suspects. There's a lot of great people doing lots of great work as well. Sure. Um, so that's. And it's a, it's a good time from an academic perspective as well. Uh, yeah, I bet that makes it fun for you to bring in and, and have a little bit more interaction in the classroom rather than just uh, doing something right out of the book. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, frankly, in a couple of my classes, I don't, I don't use textbooks anymore, case books, because they're just too rigid. There's too out of, they're, they're way too out of date and they're too expensive. And there's just so much free information uh, up there on the, um, on the internet itself also. And some students actually get, get a little, um, nervous when we don't have a textbook, but um, I think they get over it pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. I do have a question. So what does 2017 hold for, for Klaus? You, see, you mentioned the Legal Tech Conference, the American Bar Association in Chicago is hosting. Is that, what are those dates, by the way? That's next week, March 15, 16 are the main days. Wednesday, Thursday, I think so maybe some, then some things like sort of or maybe it's Thursday, Friday are the main days, but next week in any case, 15th, 16th with um, sort of activities before and after. And just on the conference note, we're going to be also at a, um, at a conference on in Vanderbilt law, on um, blockchain, I think on the law, that's the focus. We'll, we will also be sort of speaking at um, and at IOT world in May, which will be cool. Um, not too many, you know, I think we'll be one of the few sort of legal tech startups being represented at IOT world. Nice. Um, and there's, you know, so there's a lot of, a lot of really amazing stuff coming, um, for clause in 2017. That's for sure. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Ivan, I think you, since you're already in Texas, you should try and make it to Chicago. I have, uh, yeah, I'm going to be, <laughs> I'm going to be back in DC all of next week. I already have that, uh, planned out. Okay. Fortunately, I wish I could be at two or three places at once because it seems as though there's always a conference that I need to attend. Yeah. I'll have to follow it online. <laughs> so what it, in going with that the next week is going to be kind of the official launch where you uh where you guys start looking for customers thereafter or, mm -hmm. or really and what does that look like uh, do you have some some targets in mind how do you market these intelligent contracts how do you market clause yeah what's the website what's the twitter handle and then we'll get into that Right. So Clause.io and at Clause HQ as a Twitter handle. Um, so in terms of target, um, our, our target is really to 
um, focus on those two verticals that we mentioned before, so supply and um, service level agreements. Um, so we see huge applications in IoT for service level agreements, ability to monitor like, um, IT server uptime, for example, application health. Um, you get smart buildings now that you can you know, monitor temperature and all those things. So um, there's a lot of applications, a lot of potential customers in that space, um, just in SLA alone. Uh, but then the reason for incorporating this, the supply elements in is that, that that gives us a broad base to focus to pretty much anybody. Anybody uses, everybody uses supply um, agreements and sales agreements. So um, the idea is that we can market that. That's going to be a broad base um, product that, that can be used by everybody. And IoT is now so kind of ubiquitous in kind of service level agreements um, that, that that can really target those that are using kind of IoT networks. Um, I don't know whether Huma, you've got any more, more points on that, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's lots of companies that are have the data, that have the contracts. They just haven't connected the dots yet. So th those are some good initial targets for us. Excellent. And, uh, and what would be your top customer that you want to essentially lock in a deal with that maybe? Nope. Certainly large companies that, are, that themselves are focused or committed to sort of the digital transformation um, concept themselves, we think are good because th that could be a long term relationship. Because, you know, we are just also um, sort of just, we think, initiating this new wave of dynamic contracting. Um, but they'll take maybe a little bit more time to get there until companies are kind of comfortable with uh, the terms and conditions changing. So the first step is really just to get their contracts to sort of wake up and come alive. And, and that'll then, cover the broad range of targeting in-house, general counsel, yeah, especially yeah. getting them aware of this product and then mm -hmm. out to obviously larger law firms. Yeah, and the feedback we've gotten already through our feedback from uh, uh, and discussions with inside counsel, outside and so forth, has really been phenomenal. Excellent. Any plans to work with the government, whether it be federal or state? Or is sure. that all on the back? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, once, you, once you start thinking about this idea, there's so, there's so many possible use cases. Like any startup, unfortunately, we have to focus. We can't do um, everything at once. But yeah, I mean, right. uh, governmental contracts, which rely a lot on um, triggering milestones and performance, make sure the contractors are doing what they say they're doing and keeping costs in line and all that. Um, smart cities and everything is just really, it's almost an endless uh, series of use cases that, you know, are possible here. Okay. Well, I go to a lot of conferences, and uh, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna keep you guys now in mind. We'll make Great. a connection. Please, please do. Make sure that if if I run into somebody that I can immediately make a connection with with you guys, I would definitely love to do that. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I, I that was would kind of lead us into some of our uh, uh, a few of our kind of last couple of questions here. Mm -hmm. it, one of one of those questions is so. I mean, this is for for most people kind of as as Ivan did earlier the kind of brain exploding yeah what haven't we covered that that you guys would would like to share that maybe is not it does not immediately come to mind as a question for us what 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 else should we know about clause sure well i think one of those is we've talked a lot about you know changing the paradigm of contracting um, and we don't want to have the impression we, we are obviously doing that but we don't want people to go away from this and have the impression that you know, this is a wholesale change we enable um, users to integrate data as much or as little as they want into contracts and that is the, this whole concept around the smart clause is that you can put in a clause that connects to uh, you know logistic services and payment it's all modular and that that's the beauty really of, of kind of focusing on the clause as as a modular element of any contract um so if you didn't want to automate payment from a contract for example you don't need to you don't you don't have to connect your payment provisions to um to a payment provider for example like stripe or paypal or, or um, ACA, for example so um that's one of the things that we want to really get out there is that you can read a lot about us and and the, the kind of wholesale changes that are going on and how we're reinventing the nature of contracting. Um, but we're doing that as much or as little as, you know, users want that to happen in their own contracts. They have complete control as to, you know, how much data they want to use, you know, how little data they want to use, um, you know, what, what types of functionality they want to automate, for example. Excellent. 
I and, love this thing. This is it's amazing. amazing. <laughs> it's, it is a it, it is a fascinating idea and and implementation. Uh, how about you, Human? Is there anything that we didn't that we didn't cover that uh, that you would like for a listener to know about? Uh, I think I think we've covered a lot, but I think just um, also maybe a distinguishing point from ourselves and quote unquote smart contracts is that um, we're not necessarily tied to any particular implementation or execution on a blockchain um, or any blockchains or distributed ledger. That's certainly part of our technology stack or in, um, integration implementation, but we are distinguished. We are dis distinct from I think a lot of. Uh, initiatives and companies that are uh, creating smart contracts because those uh, those of, often refer to or by de frankly they de by default they refer to things that are not contracts um, and that are necessarily run distributedly um, that are more about automating uh, business operations which is great but it's really not uh, a, co a contract in any legal sense of uh, the, the, the term or certainly not enforceable so that is certainly I think part of a bro the broader ecosystem and changes that are going on, but um, we really are uh, legal, enforceable contracts that lawyers would be quite comfortable with um, using. Excellent, and it's the, the uh, I want to reiterate, it is a, a non-static, uh, living, breathing mm -hmm. contract, or as you guys have termed it, a dynamic contract. And I, I think I now, thank you to you, thank you for being here because yeah, I think I now understand a little bit more what you meant by that, which I, it, it took me quite a bit of reading uh, previously to, to get that. So do you, or find, you can just listen or watch this podcast. You like can I always do. listen or watch yeah. this. Amazing. That's right. But do you find that you've had any difficulty describing this to your potential customers? Has it been kind of the brain? Experience? Yeah, there, there, there's some education, depends who, you know, but um, I think once they get the concept, we all see light bulbs go off like we literally saw with you two. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so I mean, it also. Part um, of the brain yeah. back here that wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> In, in, lot, yeah, in lots of contracts today, there is some form of uh, dynamism, like the price depending on this. The price will change if the supplier's costs go up or down. So there's already some inherent dynamism in contracts. And that's if you get that, which, which people in the transactional and business world already understand, then, then they sort of get like where we would fit in there. Um, and so they, sometimes there's a little bit of educa education curve, but um, people in the know sort of get it pretty quickly, quite frankly. Cool. Yeah, that is great. So let me wrap up with, I mean, I think we've got some good stuff here to go with for, for our replay. Let's wrap up with where do people find you uh, and how do they get in contact with you? We've, we've talked about uh, the website is clause.io. You can be found on Twitter at clausehq. What about the two of you individually? Peter. Yeah, so um, Peter at Claws.io is my uh, my email, and um, Human is, is Human at Claws.io. Okay. I'm on Twitter at Human Shadab as well. At Human Shadab, and Peter, I believe you are on Twitter at I'm Peter also on Hunt. Twitter, yeah, uh, at, at Peter Hunt. Okay. Yeah. So those are great, and... And would you, do you prefer that somebody reach out to you by either email or, or Twitter? We're, uh, we're big Twitter users here at Legal Tech Live, but uh, I don't know if, if there's a preference for either of you. Um, e email's great. Email's I mean, who, who man's uh, really active on, on, on Twitter? I, um, I don't have much of interest. Yeah. In so I don't have that many You're problems. busy running a company, I understand. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, tw uh, email's fine either way. Okay, excellent. Guys, excellent. Peter, our, our guests today were Peter Hun, who is the co-founder and CEO of Claus HQ, and Human Shadab. And, and what are, I know that you're one of the Just founders. Right? His name every single time we say it. Yep, co-founder and COO. And COO. Thank you again, guys. Fascinating stuff. What we usually like to do at the end of a show is tell you guys that you know, we're, we're essentially tech evangelists. We, we love legal tech evangelists specifically. So if you need anything from us, please reach out. If it's just simply, hey, you know, we got this new blog post, would you share it out for us? Let us, you know, 
Cool. Yeah, you know, tag, reach out tag us in what you think you, we could uh, evangelize, help evangelize for you. Thanks so much. Okay, we're just evangelizing the legal tech space. We and, just and want order. people to know that there's some real innovation going on here in, in a, a traditionally stagnant industry. So, mm -hmm. so don't be afraid to reach out and, and just say, hey, will you share this out? Kind of cool thing that we got going on something exciting and, and like Ivan said, just tag us in the, even tag us in a post and we'll share it out. Uh, don't, don't, uh, don't be afraid to uh, stay in contact uh, through the social channels. Great. Thank Absolutely. You for your time, guys, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much guys. Thanks. Very exciting Happy. stuff. Again, we were here with Peter Hun and Human Shadab from Claws and you can find them online at Claws HQ on Twitter claws.io is their website. Thank you for to our listeners. I'm Nick Rishwain here with my co-host. I've been Raiklin. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great week, guys. Have a good one. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.